Today, I want to talk a little bit about empaths and illness and how empaths are affected by illness. You see, um, I still get a lot of mail from people who are struggling with illness and, um, and they speak about the fears they're going through and they speak about how hard it is for them to keep their energy up while they're going through illness. And, um, and I see these posts on Facebook and I receive letters. And even though I keep feeling like, wow, I feel as though I've given all the information I can and I feel as though I've put out so many videos on the subject, but I'm realizing by the letters I get and by the questions I get, there's still, there's still more for me to talk about. And one of the things that I can sense from a lot of the letters or the messages I'm reading on Facebook that people write on my page or in my groups, what I can sense is that a lot of these letters or uh, struggles that are coming from people who are dealing with illness but also trying to cope with the fear of the illness are coming from people who are empaths. So I tend to sense and identify the, the traits through, you know, by what they're saying in the messages and in the emails that they're empaths because of the, what they're describing that they're feeling. So I wanted to start first by describing to you what I believe are the traits of an empath. So let's start with that first before we dive into empaths and illness. So an empath is basically a person who feels what the people around them are feeling. You kind of take them on as your own feelings and you can't always separate the feelings and the emotions of others from your own. So when you see another person in pain, you feel their pain and you feel you have to help them. You're just someone who has to help them. And if you don't help them, it leaves a niggling feeling. You, you can't walk away. So a part of that is, of course, being human. But the problem is that if you feel that for everybody and you are being bombarded by mass media, social media of people in pain all the time, you can actually start to suffer from, um, um, from empathy fatigue or from compassion fatigue because you're just being bombarded by feelings, other people's feelings, other people's problems, other people's pain. You're just being bombarded by that ongoing. So basically, the, um, th that is one of the issues of being an empath. So somebody who is not an empath it's not that they wouldn't stop to help someone, but they wouldn't take on their pain as their own. They wouldn't feel compelled that if I don't help this person, I'm not alleviating my own pain in my own body. It's almost as if an empath actually feels that connection that we are all one, which although we are all one, um, with an empath, when they came into this physical, the, they didn't have the boundary between themselves and everyone around them. That boundary is kind of lost and we need that boundary in order to survive in this physical world. Um, the, the other issue that empaths have is that because they feel the problems of everyone else and because they feel compelled to have, er, help everyone, people who have problems <clears throat> excuse me, I have a little bit of a sore throat. People who have problems tend to gravitate towards empaths. So if you're an empath, everybody wants to cry on your shoulder. <clears throat> everybody comes to you for help and you can suffer from burnout. And as I said, compassion fatigue because you are so compassionate and your compassionate fatigue comes from not just the, all the people that come to you for help but the cruelty you see around the world cruelty to animals and things like that and so you get involved in causes thinking you're going to help the world but what it ends up doing is it ends up burning you out because you just take it all on in in your own body the world burns you out so what happens with empaths is that they also become susceptible to develop um, symptoms in their body because they're constantly taking on things, emotions and feelings and energy that's not theirs, constantly helping people. Um, and then because empaths feel that they 
can um, that they that they can't disappoint people. They have to help everyone. Many of the conditions empaths develop are also <clears throat> what you can call mysterious conditions, which doctors don't have a cure for it. Um, doctors will tell you, oh, you just have to manage with these symptoms or there's no cure for it. And they make you feel that you have to live with these conditions forever because there is no medical cure. And many of these conditions can be types of cancers. It can be MS, um, different types of conditions like that, which doctors have no cure. The reason why doctors have no cure is because those conditions are not what I call medical conditions or physical conditions. They are conditions of your body crying out to be helped. Your body is crying out for attention to take care of you because you are so busy trying to take care of everyone else because you can't separate your emotions from everybody else's emotions. Um, and on top of that, to compound it, you attract more sob stories and um, more things that depress you and actually push you further into that darkness because you are the kind of pe person to feel everyone else's pain. So as you attract more, you start to feel, oh my God, what kind of world do we live in? It's so negative, everybody has cancer. And then you start to imagine that you have it. And eventually you, everything you do becomes focused from a point of, oh, I better do everything I can to avoid it. But it comes from this place of fear of, oh my God, but everybody has it. And eventually you may get a diagnosis and then that diagnosis puts you into fear. And I am actually describing what I went through and people find it very hard to climb out of that spiral. And a common question I get asked is, well, you had a near-death experience, that's how you came out of it. How can I do it without having a near-death experience? So one of the reasons I share what I share is because I believe you don't have to have a near-death experience. Number one is you need to be aware of what's going on. And what's going on is what I just explained to you. What's going on is that you are an empath. This is what you have a tendency to do. I did not know this. If I knew this, it would have helped me tremendously. So that's number one, be aware. I am an empath. I have a tendency to absorb everyone else's emotions. I have a tendency to not be able to walk away and get fatigued and, and so on and so on. So if you need to rewind back to what I just said as I described an empath, please do so. If you resonate with that, I would like you to really get that, that be aware that that's your tendency. Now let's talk about how to counter that or how to mitigate that. And by the way, if you have questions for me, please submit them in now so that Danny, who's behind the scenes, can grab some of the good ones. And, um, and he's waving at you guys, although you can't see him, but he's behind the scenes and he's gonna grab some of the uh, powerful questions and read them out after I finished this piece. Um, and so the most likely questions to get heard or to get chosen are the ones that are on topic on what I'm speaking about. Um, but of course, if we run out of those questions or don't have any questions that are on topic, he will look to other questions. And also, if there's less of a backstory and if you get to your question more quickly, then he can find it quicker. Um, I do go back and read questions after and sometimes I answer them the following week. I do have two questions today I'm going to answer which came from last week, so stay tuned. But anyway, if you are in this situation that I described, either you're already dealing with an illness and you've identified as an empath and you're struggling to get out of it, or you are an empath and you relate to everything I described, but maybe you don't have a physical illness yet, whatever it is, that's, that's fine. So first of all, what uh, the first thing I want you to know, apart from being aware that you're an empath and that's the tendency, but to mitigate that, the first thing I want you to be aware of <clears throat> is that empaths are not uh, have a tendency to not be grounded in their physical bodies. They're not rooted in their physical bodies. Um, 
they are more rooted or more, um, they're all over the place. Empaths tend to be, tend to allow others' emotions, take them where others want them to go, or we are tuning in to our souls up in the ethers. We are very connected up there, but then we don't use our connection for ourselves. We use it to help other people. But when it comes to being grounded for ourselves, that is our weakest area. We tend to neglect ourselves. Empaths have a tendency to neglect ourselves. So for an empath, your mission is really to take care of yourself. This is why I keep saying it's important to love yourself. So for an empath, what does it mean to love themselves? It means that you need to be okay with putting yourself first when it comes to your physical and extreme self-care. You really need to be okay with that. Empaths struggle with that, but that is your mission in this life. That is your challenge. That is where you need to get out of your comfort zone. Even if it means taking time to do things for your body, like um, creating a health, a, f um, a food regime, an eating regime that works for you, rather than grabbing stuff on the go because you're in a rush helping other people, constantly helping other people. And so you don't take care of your own food needs and, and health and dietary needs. You don't include movement in your body. Movement is really good, like yoga and things like that. But the reason our excuse for doing none of those things is because we keep saying, we don't have time. We don't have time. <clears throat> Why do we not have time? We don't have time because we're so busy trying to be something for everyone else. So the number one thing that an empath has to do is to take the time every single day to get rooted and grounded within their own physical body. You feel disconnected from your body when you're an empath. You feel more connected to all the energies out there, the energies of everyone else which are drawing you and draining you. So it becomes really important. And it's not about meditating. For an empath, meditating or being connected to the other side, you don't even need to meditate. You're very connected to, uh, to a lot of things, but your connection is very, sometimes very scattered. What an empath needs is grounding, even if it means visualizing um, roots coming out of your feet and into the planet, into earth, and creating strong roots with branches. But what I suggest for empaths is movement. Go out in nature and walk, get tired, feel your body sweating and getting tired. Get out of your comfort zone, but with your body, with your physical body. Take time out for yoga or stretching or Pilates or anything like that. For an empath, that's important for you to feel your body. Um, very often empaths, um, we, we get drained and we attract illnesses because that's our body's way of crying out for attention because we have been there to help everyone else. We, go, we are attracted to helping people through their illnesses, through their physical discomforts, through their pain, but our body is there tr crying out saying, what about me? What about my physical needs? So take care of your physical needs before your body cries out for it. If your body is crying out for it, stop trying to just constantly connect and connect. You are connected, that's a given. You need to now ground your body and give your body what it needs. That is one of the hardest things for an empath to do. And that is your mission. Love yourself and your body enough to give it what it needs and give it time. Give it the time to do the yoga or to eat the foods that nourish you and resonate with you. The foods that make you feel good. And, and do it from a place of loving yourself, not from a place of fear of getting an illness. That's a tendency that empaths have. We have a tendency to take on so much, get tired, get worn out, get symptoms, and then it's a fear of those symptoms getting worse that we then tend to start reaching for foods that we think we should have. It's not about that. It's about tune into your own physical body, get grounded, and do what it takes to nurture that. The second thing an empath can do is to visualize a protection energy around you where only love can get in, but none of your energy gets leaked out and drained to everything else that happens around you. 
That's a visualization that I find works for me. For me, that is a good boundary because one of the things about um, having really strong boundaries, it's very important to have boundaries, but for different people, different boundaries are important. Um, for empaths, they want to be able to feel the love from the outside world. So you don't want to have boundaries that prevent the love from outside to, to get in, but you do want the boundaries to prevent all the fear and the, and the draining energy and uh, all the, yeah, basically the fear and the panic and the anger and everything that's happening outside. You want to prevent all of that from getting in. So what I tend to do is I imagine a, um, a boundary that has got tiny, tiny holes in it. So it's like a protective, not even a wall, but it's like a light, a boundary made of light. And this boundary is really strong and really thick. However, it's got tiny, tiny, tiny holes in it, like a strainer and, and only um, energy that is of very high frequency can pass through those holes. And that's how I created it in my own visualization. So when I do this every day, I have this boundary, but I call it, um, I actually call it a protection energy instead of calling it a boundary. And so it's like a strainer or a filter. We can call it a filter. And what it does is that it filters out the energies that don't serve me, but only allow in the energies that are of the highest frequency, the energies of love. So if people have messages for me that are going to uplift me, then that is what I will receive. And sometimes what happens is it can be the same message, but you will see it in a different way. When you are allowing everything in, when you're allowing the bad and the good and the negative and the positive and the fear and the pain and the anger and everything in, you can even interpret messages differently because you are now looking at it through these filters that you've gathered. But if you create a filter, that only allows the highest frequency in, um, then what it does is it keeps out all those fear-based frequencies. And then when you interpret other people's messages, you're interpreting it from a higher frequency and you will see the love in their message as opposed to the just the pain and the fear. And you'll be able to help them. Now, this, now here's the trick. With an empath, it's very important for you to stay in that love energy and help people by being in that love energy, not help people by becoming drained by them. That is very important for you to know. And you can do this by creating that filter. You are not being of a disservice when you keep out the fear-based energies. Um, people do sometimes say things that like, oh, you are just avoiding um, the truth. You're burying your head in the sand. You're not listening to the truth, the which is, of course, the fear-based and the, the, the very draining messages. And they make you may make you feel that way, which then draws you back into getting your hands dirty in the fear-based messages, which draws the energy back out of you. Now, you don't do yourself a service by doing that, and you don't do anyone else a service by doing that, by getting down there, because you are not helping uplift them by being one of the people with the drained energy. You're not helping uplift them, and you're not helping yourself. And eventually, your body will cry out to be heard again. So that's my point. So create that filter around you, visualize it with tiny, tiny holes, visualize bright light surrounding you, a thick layer of bright light with tiny, tiny holes. You're not keeping people out, but you're just filtering the frequency at which they are operating in the world and allowing only the ones that nourish you to come in. If everybody did this, we would change the planet. So I'm not asking you to do anything negative that's keeping people out. In fact, it's something that will help uplift the planet because you will be uplifted and you will be taking yourself wherever you go. Okay, so we said number one is to ground yourself in your body, feel your body, movement in your body. Um, number two is to visualize 
um, and a filter around you. Number three, start to become aware of what drains your energy. Um, start to become aware of what charges your energy and start to introduce more things into your life that charge your energy, whatever it may be. You know, it could be, um, it, it could be doing something like taking time out for yourself to do yoga, walk in nature or play with your puppy or your children or your babies. Introduce something into your day every day that charges your energy, charges your battery. And it could also be something creative like getting into art or something like that. Um, and then number four would be to check out how you feel about things like where are your energy levels and so um, for example with things like um, if you want to change your your diet for example and you think oh I need to change my diet I want to take out time time out every day and and create a better eating regime or I want to do exercise one of the problems or one of the things that empaths have a tendency to do is we tend to take our um, instructions from the outside world. I'm going to invite you to take your instructions from your inner world and then listen to them because we tend to get the messages, but we don't heed them. We don't listen to them. We are so in tune with other people. We don't tune into our own messages. So listen to your own messages and ask your own body, okay, what is it I'm supposed to eat to nourish myself right now? I'm not feeling great. What is it I'm supposed to eat? What's good for my body? What does my body call out for? So our downfall is we then tend to go and research, oh, should I go plant-based? Should I go paleo? Should I do this? And we research everything. It's really, you know, you can research everything as information, but but avoid feeling, oh, I have to do this, I have to do this, and then getting overwhelmed and confused. No, go away from it. Stay away from everything for 24 hours and then tune in what feels right for me. So just to give you an example, my own rule of thumb for myself, and this may not fit everybody. Um, there's so much information about food and diet out there that I don't I, I don't add to that clutter and I tell people to tune in and here's what I do. Um, when I'm feeling run down, what I tend to do is I tend to eat less. I feel that my body works better when I eat less, when I'm really run down. So I have just a couple of um, just really simple rules. One is I eat two meals a day and I make sure they're, they're healthy, clean, clean, healthy food, protein, vegetables, fruit, smoothie, you know, so two, two good meals a day and maybe a healthy snack in between. So a meal in the morning, meal in the evening. This is if I'm feeling run down, unhealthy, feeling like a flu coming on, tired from traveling. So rule of thumb for me is cut down to just two meals a day, one in the morning, one in the evening. So my body has time to process between the meals. That's rule number one. And the food has to be clean, healthy food. Um, and rule number two, drink lots of water, lots and lots and lots of water. So those are the two basic rules. I cut right back on caffeine and I cut out sugar and gluten when I'm not feeling good uh, at all. So uh, it's so basic. It's so simple. I may introduce vitamin C or something like that, but it's like I keep it as simple as possible so that I can stick to it. And here's why, because I know my body has the capacity to heal and so does yours. It's when we make it complicated and we get into all this fear-based thinking that we feel our downfall. And I always say, keep it really simple so that your body and your mind can handle it. Don't overwhelm yourself. Empaths have a tendency to get overwhelmed very easily. So don't do that to yourself. Just keep it simple. Again, that's what I do. When I'm feeling unwell, unplugged, unrested, traveled too much, jet lagged, fatigued, fluish, 
really simple. Two meals a day, really clean food, um, lots and lots of water and vitamin C and no caffeine, no sugar. That's how simple it is for me. Um, you can try all the other stuff, you know, everything that's going around, like have celery juice every day or take collagen or whatever. You can try all of that, but do it because you feel like doing it, not out of a fear of, oh my God, I read this article. This is what I'm doing wrong. Cut out all of that. That's overwhelming. That is stressing your system. That's stressing your mind. That is giving you overload. Empaths have a tendency to go into this overload, which actually contributes to your stress. So that was number four. Check in how you feel about what you're, um, what you're, about what you're taking in and check in what, how you feel about what you're doing. Uh, and sometimes it calls for you to step out of your comfort zone, listen to it, okay? Listen to it when it calls for you to step out of your comfort zone. Your messages will never make you feel fearful, but they will call you to step out of your comfort zone. And number five is stop looking for a reason for everything that's happening. Stop processing. Stop trying to figure it all out. Just stop stop, stop and relax. Um, one time I had a wonderful guest here, Uma Girish, a wonderful lady who's written two books and also helps with grief, grief counseling. And she said, uh, she gave a quote that really, that I loved where she said, if your house is burning down, you would put out the fire first. You wouldn't look for the cause of the fire until you've put out the fire. So a lot of us get so caught up in looking for the cause of what we're going through that it creates even more stress. So stop, 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 stop. Stop looking for the cause. Stop looking for the reason behind your illness. Just stop. It'll come to you in time. And chances are it's just coming from you being overwhelmed and you're adding to the overwhelm. All you have to do is just take on a simple regime get grounded in your body and keep it really, really simple. That's what I encourage you to do. And a couple of things I wanna mention is that when you're an empath, you are what, um, what I would label as being highly suggestible. Now, Joe Dispenza speaks a lot about being um, people who are highly suggestible and people who are not. And he speaks about uh, this in his book, You Are the Placebo, where he says that placebos tend to work for people who are highly suggestible. What I have started to realize with the people that I am coming across and meeting is that people who are empaths are highly suggestible. This means that both positive and negative suggestions, literally you feel them. So the good news is that positive things actually affect you as much in your body. But your job is to kind of stay in that, in that mode. But don't force yourself. When you're feeling fear and negative emotions, allow them, but at the same time, um, and embrace yourself, love yourself through it. Don't fear the negative emotions. Don't push them out. It's a part of who you are. A part of loving yourself is loving all of you, including any negative emotions that come up. But the thing is, be aware that this is just a phase. You're going to get past it. Your body can handle it. And love yourself through it and start asking yourself, um, how can I increase <clears throat> excuse me, how can I increase my energy? What can I do to recharge my battery? And um, start asking yourself, how can I ground myself more? How can I love myself more? How, and introduce movements, introduce things into your, uh, you know, and maybe change, change up the way you eat a little bit. Try a few things. But the first thing is don't suppress the fear. Allow it but introduce a few other things like watching this video. Um, the other thing about empaths I wanna say is that empaths, many of them have lost themselves. We lose ourselves to other people. 
We dress the way we think people want us to dress. We say what we think other people want us to hear. We do things so as not to disappoint people. Be aware that as an empath, you have a tendency to do this. And your body and yourself and your soul is crying out to be heard and to be expressed. So be aware. And another thing you can do is to go on a journey of discovering who you are. So how do you discover who you are? Ask yourself questions like, who would I be if I wasn't afraid? What would I wear if I wasn't afraid of what people thought of me? What would I be doing if I wasn't afraid of disappointing other people? These are the kinds of questions to ask yourself to discover who you are. Empaths tend to suppress themselves to, um, so that other people can be heard. The, we tend to dim our light so that um, we, we tend to make ourselves small so others can feel big. And we dim our light because we want to blend in with everyone else who's dimmed their light. But instead, if we shone our light, we would be inspiring other people to do the same. So your job as an empath is to shine your light as bright as you can and to allow yourself to be who you are. Whatever you're going through, whatever illness, whatever you're dealing with, um, allow yourself to shine your light and allow yourself to get grounded in your physical body um, and, and turn inward and ask yourself how you feel. So thank you for tuning in, but I am going to go into a couple of questions that came up last week in last week's video. One of them was from a, a lady by the name of Kanika Marwa, and she says, uh, what I want to ask you is, can people who we love and care for also be toxic for us? And if yes, how do we identify those re relationships and how should we deal with them? So the answer is yes, people who we love and care for can drain our energy. So I tend not to use the word toxic. I tend to use that very rarely because um, people don't mean to be toxic but they can be um, toxic for you because they drain your energy. So I simply say, yes, people can drain your energy. Even people you love can drain your energy. So all you have to do is be aware of it, that when you are away from this person, do you feel your energy recharged? Now, the thing to ask yourself, the, this, is, this is really important, is that are you with this person because you are afraid to disappoint them? Or are you with this person because you love them? So sometimes we can be with people who are draining for us, but we don't love them. They are toxic for us and we don't love them, but we are afraid to walk away from them because um, we are afraid to disappoint them. We're, we are afraid of their reaction and we don't want to deal with their reaction. So that is a whole other issue where you really need to work, get help if you need to get counseling or some help or watch some of my other videos on relationships. But you really need to figure out a way to get the courage to get your energy levels to a level where you are willing to walk away. Now, when you are willing to walk away from such a relationship, either they change because, they, because you're too important to them and they want to hold on to you, um, or you find they're not going to change and you needed to walk away in order to open the space for somebody new to come in. But here's the, 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 the second kind of situation though, is what if you do love the person and the person is someone you do want to spend the rest of your life with, or they could be your, your child, a special needs child who is very, very draining and you're not going to walk away from them. Or they could be an aging parent who can't help themselves. They need your love, they need your support, but it can be very draining. So in this situation, you don't want to walk away from them, but you do need to be aware that they are draining your energy. And for the health of the relationship, you need to take time out for yourself where you really do focus on charging your batteries. And so it's not just taking time out for yourself so you can catch up on work and other things that drain you. 
you really, really need to take time out for yourself to charge your batteries. Now, even in the healthiest of relationships, when you are together 24 seven, <clears throat> you do drain each other. So it's really important, even in the healthiest of relationships, to take time out for yourself, um, to, to go out with your, with your pals, just to go out with your pals, laugh, have a good time, or to spend time alone to charge your batteries, go listen to music, go for a walk, watch a movie, and don't feel guilty about doing it. And in the beginning, you might need to do it a lot because you've never thought of it or you've never done it before. And don't feel guilty about it. Because as you get into the habit of doing it, as you get into the habit of making time every day of doing it, what'll happen is that your energy will be so rejuvenated that when you're with this person, they will notice a change. And you will notice, particularly if it's an aging parent or a special needs child, <clears throat> or generally your toddlers and children that are draining you, what you'll notice is that when your energy is high and full and rejuvenated, and you're there in the presence of these people, you will energize them as opposed to being a depleted person who's going to deplete them. And you will need to be around them less in order to rejuvenate them, but they will also um, react to you better and not be as draining. So this is the, the situation that I'm always trying to convey is that when your energy is high, um, you get a different reaction. People are less draining towards you. So the question of, should I be around draining people? It becomes redundant because the higher your energy, the less draining other people are because they become uplifted by your energy. So the important thing is to focus on uplifting your energy, even if it means taking time out from draining people. The second question I had um, that I wanted to answer from last week was from Jurgita Gaben. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Um, and Jurgita says that, is it possible to stay in the state of love and creating that space of love if you are not a healer or public speaker? Um, I love art and I constantly was hearing that leave that to your hobbies and get the job that gives you constant earnings. In other words, from my understanding is you're saying, is it possible to stay in that space of love if you are in a place of work, which you have chosen purely to earn the money? Um, so now it all depends on how how you feel. I believe it is possible, but you really have to be aware that with the time that you have outside of that work, you need to uplift your energy. You really need to focus on getting your energy high by, by spending all that time on your creative hobby. And when you are spending your time on that creative hobby and getting your energy high, chances are, <clears throat> chances are you will encounter synchronicities that will take you to a space where um, you will be able to earn a living from doing what you love. It's just that most people don't have the courage to spend enough of their time to doing what uplifts their energy. That is the key. That is really the only key because even when I first started out, um, I was actually doing something that was um, <clears throat> when, even before my book was discovered by Wayne Dyer. I was trying to find something that, that I loved to do, but I had to balance it with something that would pay the bills. So it wasn't quite right, but it wasn't something I hated. So the key is don't take a job you hate just for the money. That's the key. At least take one that gives you a certain level of freedom to give you time to do what you love. That's what I did. I took on something that was still gave me a lot of freedom and was still something that I liked, although I wasn't super passionate about it, but it was like, okay, it paid the bills. I can do this. So at least if you can do that and use the rest of the time following your passion, doors will open up for you. They really will. The balance is in spending more of your time that uplifts your energy than what drains your energy. And even the activities that don't uplift you, try to disengage from activities that completely drain you 
or spend as little time as you can doing those activities or get to a place where you uplift your energy that even so-called draining activities no longer feel draining because you are so uplifted. Um, I hope you got a lot out of this, uh, this video. I'm going to just check with Danny if we have any, maybe one or two questions from listeners. Um, go ahead, Danny. I have one question here for you, which I'm hoping will confuse you. <laughs> That's always good. Wendy Ting writes, Hello, Anita. When you are confused and are trying to listen to your inner messages, what are the things that you do daily to help you stay grounded? Could you give some specific examples? So one of the examples that I do is I like visualizing. And I'll tell you uh, another key that really helps, which I only started to do this fairly recently, is movement. And I find that actually moving, and I'm also trying to get into a regime of doing yoga every day, and forget about the benefits of yoga in terms of just exercising and getting your body in shape. You know, there's a lot of people that are addicted to getting their body in shape because they have an external image of what they need to look like. Forget about that. I am talking about integrating your soul with your physical body. Do what it takes to integrate your soul with your physical body. That to me is what, uh, what yoga is. And so the kinds of practices is really even just doing a couple of yoga poses or any other stretches or whatever resonates with you, whatever feels good, just doing that every morning. And another one is deep breaths because, it, because breathing, focusing on your breath brings you back into your body. Getting grounded means being in the physical. Um, ungrounded means being up there in the ethers. Now, when you are in the physical and you're grounded, you can then connect more to your soul's purpose. When we don't get grounded, we are lost in everybody else and all the information out there. And today that's kind of getting worse and worse because of all the mass media and the news. So get back in your physical body, whatever it takes. For me, it's deep breaths, sitting quiet, turning on the music and doing a few stretches and a few poses. Um, I love walking. Uh, I love walking out in the sunshine and I live by the ocean, which I love, but anything like that and anything to do with feeling your body movement. So thanks for that question. And, and, and back to your, uh, just your point about confusion. When you are doing those stretches, when you are walking, when you are more focused on your body, when you're focused on your breath, that's when you feel the clarity. That's when your soul comes through and gives you a clearer message of all the things that were confusing you. And any more questions? There's one more question that's just come up. It's from Tachanya, and I believe the correct pronunciation, it's Dreisig. She says, the better I feel with me and my life, the more my sister tries to drain my energy. Ooh. It's that obvious. I love her, but I don't know how to deal with her. What can I do? Oh, exactly what I mentioned to you earlier. So the thing is, you really have to focus, um, focus on yourself. So. I, I know that m your question probably helped a lot of people because there's a lot of people that probably relate to this. Maybe not their sister, maybe, um, maybe a friend, a cousin, somebody in their life, somebody in their social media circle that will do what they can to drain them. So here's the thing to be aware of. Your sister is envious of you. She wants what you have. So it comes from a place of fear and lack. So recognize that first. Here's another tendency that empaths have. When we recognize that fear and lack, we then, our hearts go out to them and we allow ourselves to become drained by trying to help them. No, the way you help her is by staying in that space. Recognize that it's, she's not being a bad person. 
She envies you and she wants what you have. The only way you can help her is to continue to stay in that space. By you going back down is not going to help her. By you staying in that space, it's going to inspire her to do it. And discreetly, um, she might be too proud to take advice from you because if she's trying to bring you down, that's usually what it means. She envies you and may be too proud, but you can discreetly figure out ways to help her that won't um, burst her pride bubble. Like leave clues, discreetly leave clues. Um, write things on your social media that she knows, she, that you know she'll read but are not targeted at her as to how you uplift your energy and why it's important for you to uplift your energy. Post a video like this one or take out a quote from this video about why it's become so important for you to uplift your energy and take time out from being with her, knowing that when you're with her, you're going to bring a bigger energy with you, which will be even better for her and for you. And thank you for that wonderful question. And um, did we have any more burning questions? Okay, so I'm being called to sign off on today's, uh, on today's show. And so I look forward to seeing you next week. Dur during the course of the week, I'm actually working on a shift network uh, course. It's not too late for you to join if you wish to. And I go deeper into many of these things on that course. But otherwise, I'll be back next week to do another video. Same time, same place. I look forward to seeing you then. If you loved this video, please follow me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, you know, the usual suspects, YouTube. Uh, so thank you so much for tuning in. Have a great week. See you next week. Bye. Thank you so much for tuning in to my video. And if you really enjoyed it, I would love for you to subscribe. And the subscribe button is here. And also I would love for you to watch my suggested video, which is over here. And if you love my content, please feel free to share it to people who you think that would benefit from it. Thank you.